Dear colleagues, welcome to my HOTEL lecture. It is a great pleasure and honor for me to present this talk today and I thank the organizers for inviting me. The title of my talk is Combustion in the Future, the Importance of Chemistry. You may know that there is an accompanying paper already available with the same title. However, for this talk I have updated some of the information and examples so that you would have some additional benefit for listening to me today. Combustion in the future must position itself against the Sustainable Development Goals. I've picked some of the most relevant ones here. Affordable and clean energy, industry, innovation and infrastructure, sustainable cities and communities and of course climate action. Climate action is of course important, but we have potentially forgotten during this COVID-19 pandemic that this problem still exists and doesn't wait for us for being solved. As a motto to precede these thoughts, I have picked a quote from Seneca. In my translation from Latin, it is not that we don't have enough time, but too much time that we have already lost. I would now like to give you some background. Climate change induced energy transformation will impact all sectors mobility, industry, heat and power, communication, agriculture, etc. Aiming for CO2 neutrality in 2050, as promised by several countries, demands changes well before 2030, because the necessary infrastructure has a long life. Future systems should be efficient, reliable, resilient, sustainable, environmentally friendly, but of course also economically viable and they should provide fair access. And since we don't know what happens in the future, the paths forward should respect technology openness. System changes like those discussed will of course affect combustion science and application. Combustion for the future may thus have to change focus. Sustainable development, Green Deal and hydrogen strategies are being discussed by many countries. What that means is that we will see more and more renewables in this time arrow towards an integrated energy system. More wind power, more solar energy, more biomass and more electric processes. Thus we are moving from the fossil era with coal, petroleum and natural gas, which have provided us with power, fuels for transport, with chemicals, with a lot of industrial processes, heat and commodities like steel or cement, towards an era with a lot more renewable electricity that demands also energy storage and conversion an era with more bio, electro, synthetic or solar fuels, where processes like biofactories and polygeneration and other new processes may matter. That will be complemented by heat pumps, green steel and other measures. For chemists, these are exciting times. Mainly it means that we are changing from hydrocarbon oxidation with hydrogen, carbon and oxygen as the elements to more of the periodic table that is involved for new fuels, new additives, new catalysts, new energy carriers, new propellants, elements to be found in biomass conversion or waste treatment and elements that can help to synthesize materials, for example, with combustion processes.
chemical storage and conversion is important and um, energy vectors that are being discussed are hydrogen or methane or other hydrogen rich molecules like ammonia. It is known that if you want to store a lot of power for a long time there is nothing but chemicals to provide this at this time. So it is interesting that the thermochemical conversion of these chemical storage agents is already known from combustion processes. Further non-carbon fuels and energy storage agents can be found in the periodic table. So non-carbon fuels can not only be hydrogen but they can include metals as for example iron. Here is an iron flame. These metals can be used in a redox cycle and the advantage is that reduction on oxidation locations could be decoupled. So one can pick a geographical location where a lot of wind or solar energy is available to reduce the metal and then ship this metal fuel to the location which can be very distant where it can then be used in the oxidation for providing clean zero carbon energy for transportation or power generation. I have already mentioned that many elements can be used in combustion synthesis. With this one can provide functional materials with well-defined properties as for example carbon black, different nanocomposites, electrodes or sensor materials. Many of these materials are useful for energy applications as for example for solar cells, fuel cells, batteries, supercapacitors or electro and photocatalysts. I would like to give two examples for combustion synthesis, in this case flame spray synthesis. And to start with a quote from this paper here, almost every metal element in the per periodic table can be utilized. I would like to show you that the references are always available somewhere below here. Now in this case the paper deals with the synthesis of tin oxide, SNO2, for gas sensors and um, the different modes of combustion in a single droplet, either in a steady or in a droplet surface micro explosion modes, were analyzed to look at the evaporation and reaction process to determine the mechanism. And you can see that the formation of the vapor and particle nucleation and the properties of the particles depend on the details of the process. My second example deals with details of the combustion synthesis of iron oxide. In this case the iron pentacarbonyl precursor was doped into a low pressure hydrogen oxygen flame and um, the process was studied using laser induced fluorescence. To measure the temperature multi-line NO leaf was used and also laser induced fluorescence was uh, applied to measure the iron atom concentration in this situation. The different curves obtained here for these two parameters show that the concentration and the uh, temperature and the location of the flame front depend strongly on the precursor concentration. So these are important data to develop a mechanism for this process. From these few examples I would like to step back a moment and think about what our combustion chemistry expertise actually relies on. I've shown to you some experimental uh, examples with diagnostics, 
that could also be used for sensing and process control. Experiments can be coupled with theory. Models can be developed to simulate the process or even develop a digital twin for it. And of course, model reduction and certainty analysis and other da data science methods can play a big role. All in all, this arsenal is being used to look at combustion processes under real pressure temperature mixture conditions to follow its dynamics and to provide insight on the molecular species formed along the way. I would like to focus a bit on diagnostics first and I've listed a couple of diagnostic targets here. We have a variety of tools encompassing lasers, mass spectrometers, microscopy and so on to measure variables like temperature and pressure, global parameters like ignition delay times or flame speeds. But for a chemist what matters is reaction progress and species identification and species concentrations. These can be measured under different combustion conditions uh, like turbulent conditions or in particle formation or in situations that may involve surfaces. I will give some such examples later on. After the process also emissions and after treatment performance may matter as well as process control with the appropriate actuators and sensors. Some ideal combustion chemistry systems with diagnostics are depicted here. They may include jet stirred reactors or plug flow reactors, shock tubes or rapid compression machines, or premixed and non premixed flames that can be coupled to mass spectrometers or gas chromatographs or laser diagnostics. Again, I will give a few examples and I will start with a more fundamental one first. In this case, low temperature oxidation was studied to provide full speciation. The system in this case was di-n-butyl ether, a biofuel, and its oxidation in a jet stirred reactor and a plug flow reactor. It was studied with gas chromatography electron ionization and vacuum ultraviolet photoionization molecular beam mass spectrometry. By the way, these abbreviations are normally found on the slides. In this case, the uh, fuel consumption and oxygen consumption with both techniques and in both systems agrees quite well. And it was important because an interesting two step uh, behavior was seen with two NTC zones. So thus it was important that consistent results were obtained. What you can't see in this slide is that also many species, mostly highly oxygenated ones, were detected in this system. The interesting behavior could be explained by competing reactions to stable species versus reactions towards chain carriers. And the new data are important for model validation and development. A more applied example is given here. In this case, an aero in engine injector was studied with the aim to reduce aircraft emissions. What was done is to measure simultaneously the OH planar laser induced fluorescence to study the flame structure with two plane kerosene PLIF to measure the concentration of the fuel and the temperature calibrated in a high pressure cell. And the pressure here is up to 18 bar. What is seen here is in gray the OH signal, and then this is a mirror image. The color coded areas here is the fuel in the top half and the uh, temperature in the bottom half. And then there is also several beige zones which are the OH gradient that encode the reaction intensity. 
What one can see from this example is that the combustion already starts inside the nozzle, which is important for modification and improvement for these aero engine injectors. A similarly challenging example is given here. A rotating detonation engine is being studied with laser diagnostics to understand the relevant physical chemical processes in this system that may be important for efficient propulsion and power generation. Especially challenging is the optical axis in this rotating device. So a single ended absorption sensor was necessary. You see this laser array entering the port here. Um, absorption sensors for temperature, water, CO2 and CO. For this, four lasers in the mid-infrared were used. And then through the same port, the back reflected light is detected. And background rejection is done with a wavelength modulation technique. Fast sampling enabled to follow the dynamics with 44 kilo samples per second. This example highlights the importance to monitor emissions in situ in engine exhaust. This permits an onboard assessment of real driving emissions made possible with a set of portable tunable dye laser sensors. You see here with varying lambda ratio concentrations of water, CO2, CO, NO, NO2 and methane, which were detected using four channels and a kilohertz repetition rate. To enhance the signal for NO and NO2, many white cells were employed. The diagnostics permit to monitor all these concentrations per cycle, represented by the individual points in the graphics. Two sensitivities are given here. The larger number is for an average of 4.8 degrees crank angle and um, the lower number, which can go down to 2 ppm for 720 degrees crank angle averaged. Combustion diagnostics can rely on many different tools. Nevertheless, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce some promising emerging techniques to you that will be reported at this symposium. The first one is tabletop photoionization mass spectrometry. Here, a fiber laser and four wave mixing in a xenon filled fiber was used to generate light up to the 15th harmonic of the incoming laser radiation. So you see this cascade here that provides vacuum ultraviolet radiation with an attractive bandwidth. And this laser device was coupled to a micro reactor. The authors have used this in a demonstration experiment for isomer identification. In this case, a keto enol system and demonstrate that these can be resolved without need to access large facilities like a synchrotron. My next example of promising emerging diagnostic techniques concerns microwave spectroscopy. It is known that rotational spectroscopy is the most highly accurate technique to determine molecular structure. You can see here beautiful spectra of dimethyl ether, formaldehyde, methyl formate and formic acid anhydride provided from this technique. A broadband chirp pulse Fourier transform microwave device was used and sampling was done from a jet stirred reactor after supersonic expansion to cool the molecules. A very important feature here was strong field coherence breaking so that one can know which spectral signature comes from which molecule. This technique could be a useful addition to the arsenal of diagnostic techniques, especially for polar molecules. 
As a last example in this context, I would like to showcase electron paramagnetic resonance radical detection in nascent soot. Here, the number of carbon-centered aromatic pi radicals was detected by EPR and seen to correlate here in this graph with the HC ratio that was obtained from Raman and photoluminescence spectra. What is not shown but also found in this paper is that this uh, number depends inversely on the particle size. In all cases, the particles were sampled from the inception region for these four different conditions. Some contain only ethylene, others benzene as a, an additive to the fuel. And uh, the correlation seems to be independent of the fuel structure, whether it's aromatic or aliphatic. Now, the inverse size dependence shows that radical loss occurs during growth. After having highlighted some diagnostics examples for combustion chemistry, although I could not go into detail, I will also spend a few moments to reflect on models for combustion chemistry. We all know that there are certain requirements for models. They should include chemical kinetics, thermodynamics and transport. And they should be state-of-the-art, physically founded, reliable, consistent, comprehensive, and it may be a little bit contradictory, applicable still to realistic cases. Increasingly, modeling uses automated and data tools. So we can profit of this by systematically constructed core mechanisms, made available by automated mechanism generation. There are data resources, for example, for model validation or mechanism checking tools and mathematical routines are being used for a systematic uncertainty analysis and mechanism reduction. Since combustion chemistry modeling has been reviewed quite recently, I will limit myself here to just three examples of promising recent developments. My first example here concerns chemical informatics. What you see here is an automated theoretical kinetics framework, AutoMEC, in its workflow. So it goes from an input mechanism to an output mechanism with a lot of in-between resources. It includes thermo and kinetics from ab initio calculations for early pyrolysis reactions. And you see that, for example, potential energy surfaces and structures and symmetry factors and hindered rotors and so on are being treated. So with an arbitrary input mechanism, these details can be used to make a more consistent mechanism as an output using calculated and fitted thermo and rate properties. My second promising example concerns machine learning in a combustion chemistry context. Here machine learning was demonstrated on the basis of a large species data set at different pressures and temperatures. The auto ignition behavior under engine conditions was shown to be predicted without detailed mechanisms from just measured species peaks in a plug flow reactor. This approach would be beneficial in cases for new fuels where only small sample volumes are available and um, so the approach, for example, measures OH and HO2 concentrations in a plug flow reactor. Now such images are converted and used for learning in a dense neural network. They are then correlated with simulated first stage initial delay times. It was shown from about 13,000 data points that were obtained this way. 
um, from simulated profiles that there is a quite good correlation between these profiles and the um, ignition delay times. So this means that on the basis of such machine learning it is not necessary to know a detailed mechanism in this case to predict the auto ignition behavior. As a third promising example, I have picked model-based experiment design. Here, a model-based design of experiment framework was used to iteratively select optimal experiments for calibration of kinetic models. The method of uncertainty minimization using polynomial chaos expansion was used and what is seen here is the prior covariance matrix for the joint uncertainty space, the prior one given in this red area, and then iteratively the most informative experiment was included. And you can see that with each iteration this uncertainty area is shrunk until with the full target set it arrives at this grey shaded area. Also, this approach of the most informative experiment gives a short list of high priority experimental conditions for the most promising data that will be needed for a certain condition. I would like to end these few examples on modeling in combustion chemistry with some personal remarks about the use of models. So please don't use just a single condition or tune a model to fit a single experimental result. It's also not useful to generate a plethora of updated or changed models to proliferate them in the literature. Also don't report models without identifying the molecular structures that are in the model. And please don't assume models to have no uncertainties or errors. Instead, please consider the definition of common targets for model validation and of round-robin experiment theory model activities within the community and of course of constraining uncertainties with appropriate methods. You have seen this scheme before, but let's now go a little bit beyond the classical combustion chemistry. And I have picked the title of Combustion Green Chemistry Opportunities. So this is all unchanged. That's our arsenal of methods. But now the key words that I put here are a little bit different. And in the context of the transformed energy system, they may matter, such as gasification, biomass conversion, catalysis, reforming fuel cells, plasma enhancement of processes, polygeneration, and many more. With the limited time available for this talk, I can again only highlight a few examples and I cannot explain all the details but must refer to the respective literature. My first example concerns gasification, a method to produce syngas from coal or biomass. Such a gasifier provides very hard conditions for species and chemistry measurements, high pressure, high temperature, basically no non-absorbing regions and very few data on spectra and line shapes. In this case, a mobile dual comb spectrometer was used plus a background free absorption technique. So in principle, mid-infrared mode lock lasers were used to provide the dual comb spectrometer and using these uh, transmission spectra, a sepstral analysis was performed, technique known from audio signal processing. Basically a molecular free induction decay signal was uh, used from the inverse of the Fourier transform of the negative logarithm of transmission spectra that then provides a background free signal. My next example highlights biomass 
pyrolysis. Here an overview of product structures was generated from the pyrolysis of camphor wood with time-resolved high mass resolution spectrometry using an orbit trap mass spectrometer. The analysis is presented in elemental ratios of H over C versus O over C here and certain structures occupy certain regions in these graphs. So for example condensed aromatics are found here, lipid structures here, lignin derived structures here and so on. The right side shows the dynamics of the process in a time series. One can see that the patterns are quite different. So in the early devolatilization, these lipid-like structures are formed, whereas in the later stages, bond breaking has happened and aromatics have been formed. Understanding biomass conversion chemistry necessitates tracing reactions with different elements than H, C and O. So here in this case reactions in the potassium chlorine sulfur systems were looked at. The background is that the reduction of corrosion and fouling from potassium and chlorine in flue gases can be um, moderated by using sulfates. So homogeneous reactions of potassium chloride with SO2 to uh, sulfates are promising. And here a well-defined hot gas reaction environment was created by using a multi-jet burner and different concentrations like that of KOH, KCl and OH were measured from broadband UV absorption, potassium atoms by uh, tunable diode lasers and also a new spectrum was detected that was assigned to a species um, KOSO. You see the measurements here and model predictions and clearly there is room for mechanism development. This transparency shows an example from catalysis, in this case for gas engine exhaust after treatment. Greenhouse gas savings can be obtained by lean burning gas engines, for example using power to gas strategies. But it was recently demonstrated that toxic HCN can be formed during NOx removal when using the selective catalytic reduction by ammonia. The reactions of ammonia with formaldehyde from partial methane oxidation can provide up to 30 ppm of the highly toxic HCN for the four commercial catalysts tested. These are the respective HCN fractions in red here. The mechanism was investigated and both by gas phase and surface spectroscopy it occurs via form amide and the surface species were confirmed by in-situ drift spectra diffuse reflectance infrared Fourier transform spectra. This catalysis example shows the importance of gas phase and surface reaction. Light alkane functionalization is being studied and the mechanism for selective olefin production by oxyhalogenation is investigated, in this case the formation of ethylene. Selective alkane functionalization is an important step towards natural gas use as an energy vector and what is depicted in the complicated picture on the left side is a multi-technique approach to investigate the interplay of the gas phase and surface reactions. So the surface is for example being looked at by prompt gamma activation analysis, operando, also PEPICO is being used, photoelectron photoion coincidence spectroscopy to look at the gas phase species. The experiments are complemented with theoretical calculations by density functional theory and then the uh, performance in the kinetics of the ethane oxybromine or oxychlorination which is different is looked at by GCMS analysis. Not only surface reactions but also electrode reactions can add complications as was 
seen here in this example of biogas-fed solid oxide fuel cells. These are interesting systems for combined heat and power generation and the system performance is of course important. Biogas is rich in CO2 and has a relatively low heating value. A 3D stack model was conceived for the fuel cell, keeping track of all important species concentrations. The model considers gas phase and electrode reactions and transport, and it was calibrated with single cell measurements. All important species consumptions and productions are seen in the top graph from the inlet to the outlet gas flow, but also in the direction 3D of the anode thickness to keep track of the concentrations within the stack. Charged species play a role in plasma-assisted chemistry, such as in reforming. Here, a plasma-activated methane dry reforming system was looked at for mechanism development. A pulsed dielectric barrier discharge in the system was used and in-situ absorption for a lot of species and the temperature. The Electron density was obtained from Thomson scattering and a 1D model was conceived to predict the time evolution of the main products. The reaction scheme is given here for a rather simple system, one would think, but the important feature here is that all the reactions in violet are normally not occurring in the gas phase systems, but these are the plasma reactions that need to be considered. My last green chemistry example concerns polygeneration for chemical production in an internal combustion engine. These are useful systems for the flexible generation of heat, power or chemicals on demand. In this example, an ozone promoted partial methane oxidation was looked at in an HCCI engine. Indeed, these systems have higher exergetic efficiency than the normal partial methane oxidation steam reforming reaction. The ozone effect was investigated and traced back to reactions of oxygen species with methane to sensitizing intermediates prior to ignition. So while the ozone concentration is already very low, Form aldehyde, for example, can buffer as a sensitizing species until ignition can occur. You have seen this scheme before, and indeed, this toolbox is unchanged. But what I would like to highlight in my final thoughts is some perceived combustion and chemistry developments, and I've picked just three the use of hydrogen, of data strategies, and of life cycle analyses. Hydrogen and combustion have already been linked long ago. As, for example, in this quote by Michael Faraday from his book, The Chemical History of a Candle. This hydrogen is a very beautiful substance. It is important to remember that this hydrogen is the only thing in nature which furnishes water as the sole product of combustion. But how well do we actually know details of hydrogen combustion under practical conditions? Here the NOx formation was revisited for low temperature lean premixed hydrogen combustion where the NO formation occurs only via the N2O and NNH routes. A test was performed of model prediction accuracy for NO. Here, the shaded area gives the uncertainty of the laser-induced fluorescence experiments for NO measurements, and a direct comparison was performed with predicted LIF signals with four different models. It is clearly seen that the two hierarchical models, the Craig model from Milano and the Galway model, give the best predictions. This slide shows a hydrogen combustion system closer to application. 
Here, the high pressure turbulence chemistry interaction was studied. It's a quite involved apparatus using single shot 2D imaging of major species, temperature, OH, and mixed refraction by a combination of Raman spectroscopy and planar laser induced fluorescence in a non premixed hydrogen nitrogen jet flame at a Reynolds number of 29,000 and at 12 bar. So in this apparatus, the high pressure combustion duct, two neodymium reactor lasers were combined to provide 1.1 joule at 532 nanometer and 2D images of hydrogen, oxygen, water and nitrogen were sampled onto four CCD cameras. The radiation was separated by dichroic mirror and notch filter array. Separately, the OH laser induced fluorescence was measured with an ICCD camera. Most importantly, flame luminosity was rejected by a pockel cell. Here, from a single flame condition, all these uh, single shot images are shown, and uh, one can thus see the performance uh, not in a scatter plot but in a true 2D multi species single shot arrangement. My next topic for the future concerns data strategies and I will give you two examples also for this point. Here the uh, prediction of electron ionization cross sections is the topic. It is very important for quantitative GCMS analysis and machine learning approaches were used here with a fast forward neural network. 16 atoms and 79 structural groups were uh, described and a large training base was configured with 396 interlaboratory cross-section data sets including 92 from new measurements. So the process is here as an example from a species structure through these descriptors uh, over the training set with a neural network to a calibration plot. Um, Better results were obtained with this large data set than the additivity met method from Fitch and Sorter, which is commonly in use. And um, it is very useful for the quantification in complex mixtures, especially when there is lack of reference compounds. The other example for data strategies shows web-based knowledge graphs here for the pollution prediction and atmospheric dispersion of ship emissions. So an integrated combustion chemistry model is used to estimate the ship emissions, an atmospheric dispersion model to predict local pollutants and on the basis of correct weather and geodata so that local action can be enabled here for Singapore. So you see these different ontologies and models that then can be combined for local prediction in real time. As my last selected topic for the future, I would like to mention life cycle analysis and its importance, for example, for fuel and vehicle combinations. This graph doesn't give any comparisons, but just depicts the step needed to determine complete, complete greenhouse gas potentials for time dependent assessment of transportation options. Time dependent because we may have different uh, technologies in the future. So this axis shows the fuel and this axis the vehicle cycle. The evaluation should rely on transparent uh, life cycle analysis methods. Here the Greek model from Argon is used. And we can see that there are a lot of needs to uh, different parts of the processes from the raw material um, extraction to the vehicle operation and on the vehicle side again from the material extraction, material processing, component manufacture until the operation and the vehicle recycling. Here only technology factors are included, but of course infrastructural, economical and social factors, factors must be included for a realistic analysis. Some results of such life cycle analyses are shown here for driving with hydrogen 
and um, compared for 2017 versus 2030 technologies. An assessment was made for the greenhouse gas emissions for hydrogen light duty vehicles in China. A similar assessment as in the plot here, which is not shown, was done for pollutant emissions and driving costs. So this is the 2017 graph, the 2030 graph, and the gasoline base case is always given here. The coal electricity share is assumed to decrease uh, from 65 to 50% in China over this time. One third of the global wind power in China is already installed in 2018. The global hydrogen so far comes to 76% from natural gas steam reforming, whereas water electrolysis is still a niche product. So improvements can be uh, obtained by water electrolysis, for example, with curtailed wind power. Now what we can see is that the 2017 picture is not very much different from the 2030 picture, only that all the technologies will have decreased CO2 equivalents per gram, uh, gram per kilometer. And uh, what wins out here is the fuel cell from biomass or from renewable electricity that remains the same in 2030. Resume briefly, I've shown you classical combustion examples. I've shown that we can use our tools in different systems that may have increased importance in the transformation of the energy and industrial production system. But I've also shown that some points may gain more importance in a hydrogen economy, in making a fair assessment of uh, the CO2 emissions by life cycle analysis and using data strategies that are not commonly so much used in our communities. Mostly uh, what is seen is that people cling to the present system and don't like transformations. It is important to create positive connotations and visions for an active commitment of people in a spirit of it's worthwhile doing. And in this sense, I've shown some pictures for Adelaide transformation that I found on the web from the industrial era, from the bell tower in 1921 or 1922, and the vision for a green Adelaide of today. I would like to end my talk again with a quote this time from Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. In my translation, concerning the future, our task is not to predict it, but to make it possible. Thank you so much for listening.